why not experiment with who you are mm. and let go of who you no longer need to be rather than think about it, perform it and be a square peg in a round hole. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Onion Soup, the show where we pull back the layers of metaphysics and reality to demystify spirituality. I'm truly excited about this episode. Today we have Mr. Kenny DeCruz. How are you doing today? Doing good, thank you. You? That would be pretty wonderful. We were having a great conversation before we got started. We were just both like, wait, let's get the hair purple. Let's get it done. <laughs> so before we dive into today's topic, just tell us a little, about, a little bit about who you are and what you do. Oh, who am I? Well, do you know, maybe it's easier to say who I'm not anymore. I am no longer a mummy's boy. I used to be a nice Catholic boy. I'm no longer obsessive compulsive. I used to have obsessive compulsive disorder. I used to have Tourette's, trichlomania, body dysmorphia. I'd twitch and, and grunt and do all sorts of things. I had eating disorders. So that was all, I guess, a throwback after having post-traumatic stress disorder. At the age of seven, my father said to me, you may never see me again. You're the head of the family now. Take care of your mother and brother. And that's after we had death threats and we went into hiding. And then my mother, brother, and I fled Uganda and left my father there not knowing whether we'd see him again. He was an enemy of state who was saving a lot of lives from Idi Amin. Now, because I unlearned I guess my mental health issues or addictions, I guess the main addiction was thinking, second guessing and surviving, but I, I let go of the mental or unlearned the mental health issues. I feel very, very lucky for the messy childhood that I had because now I can meet people, male and female in their places of a broken spirit and I can share my tools and enable them to get out and get over the repeating script that a lot, a lot of people have, most people have, I'd say, and live conscious, connected lives creatively and in love beyond the fear. How did I do? <laughs> wow. Wonderful. <laughs> Honestly, that was a great segue into what we're talking about, which is focusing on masculine and feminine energy. You mentioned being able to sit with men and women alike and really help them, I guess, not just connect to nature around them, but really connect to themselves. So yeah. what is masculine and feminine energy and the ideas behind that? I was brought up, as I say, a mum mummy's boy. To me, what that means is an elevated position by the women where I'm the golden boy. So for my mother, my godmother, my grandmother, and a lot of people see that as a positive thing or a uh, a kind of privilege and everything comes as a, a cost. So with that, I was literally responsible for the emotions of the women. And I dare not for my own safety or my own ego get anything wrong because I couldn't bear the thought of losing my position. And that could be quite simply criticism or a withdrawal or anything like that. So I knew from a very, very young age how the feminine mind and feelings and second guessing and passive aggression, et cetera, et cetera, work. And I would say there are so many positive aspects of the feminine and everything has its shadow as there is toxic masculinity, which is yang energy is out and it's loud. There's toxic femininity, which is yin energy, which is the withdrawal and the criticism. So I got to know the female ways. Another thing, a couple of things that it cost me is I knew I wasn't to be like the other men who were, who were generally criticized. And that way the men were apart from me. I was taken by the women and to an extent mistrusted by the children. And I needed to be responsible for the adult women. So I couldn't really be free, a free spirited child to just play with the other kids. So there's a cost to all of these things. So I was brought up with the femininity and I knew it very well. And I'd say part of that, even before 
the death threats and refugee camps was part of my trauma and my need to second guess. And I would say so many males are so often in their heads trying to fix and figure things out and second guess and stay out of trouble. Mm. Um, it's shocking. It's absolutely terrible. And I would say the two main things that control the male are a fear of abandonment and a fear of humiliation. Mm. On the masculine side, well, maybe an easier way to describe this is I would say the difference between a boy and a man is boys generally come from fear. And again, maybe fear of being left out and being laughed at, where men can come from love. And that can generally happen if they take care of the boy inside of them, if they take care of their inner child, rather than handing this child over for other people's approval. Boys generally make a lot of noise and they need to prove themselves. There's a lot of testosterone. There's a lot of pushing for boundaries. That's normal because people need to be met at boundaries to feel safe. And they're, they're kind of pushing, show me, show me where and how and what. I, I've been told that sheep do the same thing. They push against fences, not because they want to escape, but they push against fences to make sure that their the fence is strong enough and they're safe from the big, big bad wolf or whatever it is. So I would say, this is where the, what was I just saying? I've lost the thread with the sheets though. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about the difference between boys and men. The boys and men. So we, we said about the, the coming from love rather than coming from noise. So boys make a lot of noise. And so much of that is about pecking order where men can be silent and can listen and can receive boys very often will second guess where men can ask questions, what's going on rather than being in the head and working out, it must be this, it must be that. Boys can generally only compete again to maintain the pecking order or because all of this fear energy or yang energy is uncontrolled and it goes out there where men can compete, but can also collaborate. So for me, including the feminine, the listening, the responding rather than reacting, including men can include the feminine and they have access to both and they can choose which one is appropriate in this moment. And I would say another thing is with boys, things can happen so quickly and it can happen in such a panic where men can slow time down, you know, as Men grow into elder years. The grandfather energy is very much calm and slow and consistent and receiving. And there's a real depth of safety that comes with that. And I would say the masculine and the feminine together, having access to both, as I feel we all do have access, um, is vitally important. And this is very little to do with men and women. I have met much more masculine women than me, and I wouldn't fight them for their masculinity. Yeah. Um, and as a man, I feel that if it wasn't for my fe femininity, I wouldn't be able to do my work so well. I wouldn't be able to be my own man, conscious, present, and connected right here and right now. Interesting. So I really want to go back to something you said earlier on. You mentioned toxic femininity. And a lot of us are familiar with toxic masculinity, but we don't oftentimes talk about the other side of that. And so I guess my question is, <clears throat> when we look at a child, a man or a boy, and uh, we place all these demanding ideals on this child from not just from the man's side, the father, but from the woman's side, the mother, this is what we expect of a boy. This is what we expect you to grow into as a man. How much of that is really differentiated between toxic masculine and feminine and just old paradigms and ideals? I wonder how it is these days, actually. And as you ask the question, I know that in the last 10, maybe 15, 20 years, as it wasn't before, one thing that I've noticed with some of the couples I've worked with is they've needed permission to be themselves 
rather than you are the male, therefore you have to act this way and provide these things and do these things and you are the female and therefore you have to blah, blah, blah. And in my relationship, my wife takes care of the finances and I gave her all my money a very, very long before we were married. It's like, if you're going to rip me off, get on with it. But meanwhile, I'm not going to live in fear. My wife drives. I don't drive. My wife recently bought power tools. I kind of flinched when I saw them and it's like, yeah, sure, I'll give it a go. But when it comes to cockroaches and spiders, <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> different stories. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is the typical roles don't work for everyone all the time. And for me, it's like, what does work and why does it work? And why not experiment with who you are mm. and let go of who you no longer need to be? rather than think about it, perform it, and be a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. And what's very interesting as well is I feel that generally when people have uh, kinks, quirks, and fetishes, I would say that very often, well, to put it this way, when I work with some of my clients, if I know what they are and they're taken out of sexuality and out of the shadow, we have the issue in hand. And very often it's a journey rather than this is the way it is. I've changed and developed as an individual and I've grown. And I remember a big change that I went through myself where until I think it was about 25 odd years ago, probably 95% of my clients were female. Um, and that was me carrying on from the script that I was used to from when I was a child. I knew how to do it with my eyes closed. And then there were things that I needed to unlearn because people saw me as a good man. And that was all well and good for them. But something wasn't right for me. And what I realized what wasn't right was that I wasn't included in this. So this might have been all well and good for other people. But unless I'm my own man it doesn't account for anything. And before I could become my own man, I had to do my adolescence. And that kicked off at the age of 34. Mm. But after my adolescence, which is rather than towing the line and doing things right, I pushed my own boundaries to find out who I don't need to be, what's been unconscious that needs to be made conscious and how to get balanced and in alignment with myself. And it's after I did my adolescence that I could truly do my childhood because I was safe enough. So I guess what I'm saying is it's supposed to be in a certain order. It doesn't always happen, happen in that order. And whatever's missing or not quite right or in the shadow, once it's included and everything's in order, then I think an individual can be their own person. And it's not job done. Then the story starts a conscious pathway. That's the way I did it. And I feel that we all have our, you know, I fancy a cosmic little tangent, if I may. Of course. We all, we all have our stories. We all have our traumas and dramas. And I made up this little story for myself to understand life. And I looked at all my the complications and the traumas and dramas in my life. Um, and while I was in them and surviving them, I hated it. It was like quick time. I was lost. I didn't know how to fix it. And as I say, I was addicted to my thoughts rather than addicted to my thoughts. Maybe it would be fairer to say I was addicted to my survival. I was addicted to staying out of trouble and not causing harm. The thought was maybe I chose that this lifetime, I would come down or up or sideways or different frequency or whatever to contribute to humanity in a certain way at this time. And also to experience certain things for my, the, the growth of my soul. Um, and also to complete with certain people or, or beings that I might have known from different dimensions, different times and places, who knows whether we had bodies or not. Um, and if I've chosen that at this time, then 
I know that same as most of us, most of the time, we're going to come down and not bring all of our awareness because if we bring all of our awareness, then we wouldn't be able to have the experience that we have. So I, my little fantasy is what if I agreed to certain pain and certain interactions and certain dramas and traumas with individuals. And that gave me the opportunity to complete with whatever needed completing. It also gave me places that at some stage in my life, I would need to revisit, not just talk about or know about, but for me, the way people set ourselves free, I feel is revisiting and feeling those feelings. And whether I'm in a, a group with a men's group with people or a one-to-one -one client or even a conversation like this, if I feel whatever it is that's in limbo, that that's, I've, I've survived or denied, then I set myself free. But if I choose to go back to the dark shadow and I feel that, then I feel it opens up the gold shadow. I can unlearn what's no longer true. And generally, in my experience, pick up my tools for my pathway. And this is where purpose comes in. And then I have the tools and I'm literally putting right what wasn't right for me. And hey, presto, here's my path. Here's my purpose. And it all fits together nicely. Now that could be a crazy fantasy of me pretending to be in control. And obviously I'm not, <laughs> but yeah. it fits together very nicely. Are any of us really in control? But <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying actually puts me in mind of a uh, soul contract and yeah. how we all are, are connected to each other with contracts that we presumably made before we entered this life. And the things that happen in our physical incarnation in this world during this time are a part of that. And it's all a part of the synchronicities and things like that. But what I hear you also saying is that as you've gone along in your current life journey, you picked up tools that allowed you to look back in your past and assess some of the traumas, trials, and tribulations and come from it from a place of non-judgment. How does someone get to that point? I, the way that I go there with myself and with other people is whatever is causing discomfort now and it could be anger it could be sadness it could be you know a repeating script in in a relationship or in relationships that keep repeating rather than being distracted by this is my trauma it's not fair i need to fix it it's like fine whatever's going on accept it this is what's going on right now but the most important thing is take a deep breath in and feel it and very often when any of this is going on, people don't breathe. Mm. There's a panic. Hold the breath. Holding the breath is literally feeding the trauma. And it's in the head and it's going all over the place like a pinball machine, but without the holes for the balls to fall down, it just goes on and on. A deep breath in and not just feeling into it now and get present. But when people are safe enough, it's like, Follow the feeling back. And that, that place that people get to generally in a split second, that's what's really going on. And that's the depressed pause button that I was talking about before. The place of trauma that really needs to be felt when people are safe enough to feel, feel it, to release it, unlearn what's no longer true. And every script that's, that's continued as clues of this is the place because they can all clear up, but get to the source, unlearn it, pick up the tools. And for me, that's the way. And there's a really interesting sin. I don't remember the guy's name, Neil Donald Klotz or something around. Neil Donald Watts? No, no. Klotz, I think it is. Neil Donald Walsh is like very mainstream, very good guy. Yeah. <laughs> but this guy he rewrote so much of Jesus's stuff, mm. translating it directly from Aramaic. And the one that blew me away 
not, not that I've studied a lot of it. I just went to a workshop because, you know, it's why I was brought up Catholic and I want to know be, what's behind everything. I want to know the deeper meanings of things without any middlemen. So I thought, yeah, here's a good cheat sheet. What blew me away is, you know, um, the whole Holy Spirit thing, mm -hmm. Father, Son and Holy Spirit and all of that. And even with spirituality, very often a lot of people's relationship, certainly in mind with Holy Spirit, is it's this thing there, this untouchable, bigger, better than thing that I better be good enough because whatever it is, I should have some or it should like me or what is this Holy Spirit thing? And that what he said is it's a mistranslation. The true translation is breath. Mm. Now, I believe that everything is energy and the more awareness I have or the less blocks I have, the greater the frequency that I have access to. And if I can breathe and be reconnected with God or spirit or nature or life or whatever you want to call it, if I can do that by simply breathing and being in alignment with myself, and literally surrendering to life or love or acceptance or whatever you want to call it. That is direct connection rather than Holy Spirit, I need to be good. I need to this, that, and the other before I have connection. For me, it's got to be right here and right now in every moment. I don't believe that, you know, people have shifts and epiphanies and all sorts of things. And that's fine. That's absolutely great. But the bottom line is living it in daily life right here and right now for me is all that matters. Well, it's, it's all that is. Mm, interesting. I wonder if you're talking about the book, Gospel of the Holy Twelve. And I don't uh, think so. Yeah, He's written a lot of books and I don't remember them. Yeah. There's, there's one where there's, it's the Gospel of the Holy Twelve and it talks about the 12 disciples who were obviously the ones that were following Christ. And, well, Jesus the Christ, rather. And it talks more, it goes more into detail about those almost 28 years of what happened and really what Christ's life was, life was like. And one thing that I find really fascinating about the story of Jesus and just the Bible in general is there really, while there are 12 disciples, really only three or four of them contributed to the New Testament. Yeah. You know, a lot of it actually comes from Paul, not to get too <laughs> religious, but, you know, a lot of it actually comes from Paul. And I found that to be really fascinating. And like you were saying with the breath, it really, and you start learning more about the deep breathing and you start researching what happened to Jesus when he was uh, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. It really puts me in mind of Pranayama and some of the other, let's call them ascended masters who did similar trials or had similar trials, yeah. meditated for days or weeks on end yeah. for extended periods of time. When we look at these figures, not just biblical figures, but ascended individuals, most of them also tend to be men, but they also seem to have more feminine aspects or characteristics with them. Why is it when we look at men of nowadays or within the past few hundred years, the idea of a man was to be so rough and to be so strong. But when we look at these men who clearly ascended into godhood, they were passive and peaceful. Yeah, well, do you know, it's interesting for me. What crosses my mind there is something my wife said to me <laughs> about a month ago. And she looks at me and she said, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. It's not that you're, you're, you're there's something wrong with you because you can't use tech or, or do so-called normal things. But what I think is going on is you're from the East and it's like, wait a minute. And what she said is people from the East, one way or another, there is an essence of gentleness, of accepting, of love, of community, of caring and sharing, of, it's almost like the, well, I guess the opposite in the West, which is all about competition. Mm. It's almost like in the East, the greater the wealth, the longer the table, mm. where in the West, the greater the wealth, 
the taller the fence is. Mm. Um, there's another really important thing, and that is that history has been rewritten. As mm. soon as a country is taken over, mysteriously, history changes to support the narrative. I mean, Jesus was probably more our color than blonde and blue. <laughs> It's, well, he wasn't blonde, he had dark hair, apparently, according to the pictures. And then we go into the whole realms of Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. And she was called a prostitute. A lot of women were put down. Where my understanding of Mary Magdalene is she was in a, a sacred intimate. Mm -hmm. And that is a pathway to enlightenment mm -hmm. through sexuality. Now, that's not any rude and crude rumpy pumpy. That's all about opening up and breathing, and yeah. being connected, and surrendering, and same as you say with pranayama and various other things, lifting the consciousness. Mm -hmm. And this is not to be taken lightly. The vehicle needs to be prepared. There needs to be safety in order for these things to happen. And the number of times I've heard of people who've got themselves in trouble raising the kundalini like if they're going to a shopping mall and it's something cool to do in your lycra. It's just not. And all of this was, was edited out of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for so many other holy women over the ages. Isis, etc., etc. But at least she's relatively well known. But all the same, there's the mystery. There's the Black Madonna. There are so many females and I once held a retreat, a kind of workshop thing in a stately home in England. I don't remember what it's called now. Every room was named after a scientist, a female scientist mm -hmm. who made huge discoveries and a huge contribution to the planet. And they all had to be in the name of their husbands. Mm -hmm. The women were edited out. The women were not allowed. And over the years, it's like, well, the patriarchy will rewrite the script, disempower the women. There's a friend of mine, Dr. Christine Page, who basically said, way, way, she does a lot of work with women and spirituality, etc. a wonderful woman. Way, 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 way back, it was all about, what do you call it, inheritance. Mm -hmm. If it's through the male line, then it can be known who's going to inherit. But if it's through the female line, then, well, we don't know necessarily whose children are from which fathers, etc., etc. And we're going way, 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 way back. So apparently, according to her, this changed in the name of inheritance and wealth. Well, what hasn't changed in the name of inheritance and wealth? It's like money has made the world go around, but I think it's in the wrong direction. Interesting. When you talk about the historical relevance of passing down the lineage or the name, didn't that start doing feudalism and the rise of the Catholic Church during the time of Constantine? And that's more history. But. And isn't that when they rewrote the Bible? And it is. It did it's, so many things. At the Council of Nicaea. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never had a conversation like this. I've read about this, but I've never had a chance. And it's like my rusty cogs are turning because I absorbed this and I'm, mm, that's interesting. Mm, that's interesting. I wonder whether you've heard of the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ by Ooh. Levi. No, I have not. I'm dead. Oh my God, what a book. While I was traveling the world, I was, it's a big fat book. It's just like the Bible because the pages are thin. The type is small and it's so, so condensed, but it's about the travels and the initiations mm. in the last years in different countries. Oh, including I'm familiar with that. Yes. Really? Yes. How Jesus was. So when uh, Joseph was originally visited by the angels to told to flee uh, Bethlehem, he went down to Tuesday because he was fleeing from King. Herod, Herod? I think so. <laughs> so, buried, yeah. so he was, we went down to Egypt and they were there for a couple of years. And then the angels. Wasn't that with Mary and Elizabeth, Jesus and John, if I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So then Joseph was supposed to go back with Jesus and Mary to Bethlehem, decided not to do that and went to Nazareth. 
instead, which is why we call him Jesus of Nazareth. He's not born in Nazareth. That's where he went instead of going back to Bethlehem. When he was in Nazareth, that's when he was with the a group called the Essenes. And that's exactly. where he learned a lot of, and this is all found in the Apocrypha for anybody that's curious about this information. But so that's where he learns a lot of the first parts of the ritual. This is actually where the Eucharist comes from, the blood of Christ. And wasn't this in Mount Carmel or something, the Carmelites? Yes, yes. So mm-hmm. later on, as Jesus starts to get further in his own studies, he leaves again and apparently goes back to Egypt to learn Kemeticism. He also apparently travels up to Tibet to learn their forms of healing and meditation and which we would now call things like Reiki. Mm. And then he traveled a lot in that particular area. But what I find most interesting about those stories is at no point did he go to the West. Mm. And when we talk, yeah. And when we talk all about the Bible, the, even we talk about the Quran and the Torah, we're talking about the Middle East. I mean, when you read, go back to Genesis, it tells you where the, where the Garden of Eden was. It's between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. It actually names all five rivers that's right there. And, and it tells you that this is what happened. But if you pick up other texts, such as the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, it actually talks about what happened before Genesis. Because so Genesis starts at the Great Flood and then goes on to not necessarily present day, but we get all the way up to Jesus and his death. And then we move on to when the rest of the apostles are killed and then Paul takes over and then the church and everything. So then it stops. And after that, we go to the next prophet. Mm-hmm. But there's a gap, right? So there's something that happened before that. And then there's something that happened after. A lot of my research has been, what's the full story? You know, what's the full timeline here? Because mm-hmm. when we look at, there's obviously things going on in the rest of the world, but it wasn't no. just the Middle East, you know? So when you start looking at the, such like the Dogon people, you know, of Africa, and they talk mm-hmm. about a time before the book of Genesis, they don't call it the book of Genesis, but they talk about a time before that. They talk about the seeding or possible seeding of humanity and things like that. And really where humans came from. I don't know how we got on this topic. <laughs> well, with that, there are a couple of things that I remember from the Levi book, the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. And one of them was, I remember the initiation chamber in Greece, um, where basically you go down the pit into the cave. And it's almost like, you know, the way that manifestation works for me is very much whatever it is that's in my shadow will reveal itself in my life for me to face and whatever it is that I fear or I give energy to will show up where in this chamber, it's a lot more instant. And I would say things in life these days with the quickening as it is, is a lot more instant. And there's the story of the chamber where most people, when they go down into it, uh, they die of snake bites. And for some reason, apparently, I mean, there are no snakes down there. But it's dark, it's deep, and it's scary. And it's the place where whatever the fears are, it's like you sit with your fears and you either come out alive (laughs) or you go back to the melting pot and you come back to try again. Mm. And there's the story of Jesus going down there and emerging and passing yet another initiation. Uh, And I've always thought, oh my God, if I went down there, now I know about the snakes. (laughs) How could I not? Think about snakes and I'll probably die. And then there are stories of, what's his name? Joseph of Arimathea, Mm -hmm. the uncle, because he was a merchant and he traveled a lot. Mm. And apparently he is the one who had the chalice that caught Jesus's blood when it was pierced by, what was the centurion's name? Longines, Longines, something rather like that. I don't know his name, but yes, the spear, which came known as the spear of destiny. The spear of destiny. And apparently, you know, there are stories that say that whoever owns the spear of destiny will rule the world. So Mm -hmm. there's this big Austrian, German, Hitler type frenzy after the spear of destiny. Anyway, story goes that uncle Joseph was holding the chalice and that's where the 
water apparently apart rather than blood poured in and this holy chalice was brought over to Glastonbury mm -hmm. in England, which is a very sacred place here. And then story goes that King Arthur had the chalice and it's a miraculous chalice. Some people say it's made of, um, was it not amethyst? I don't remember the crystal. Some people say it was wood, who knows, mm -hmm. but apparently Arthur used to, he was custodian of it and he would heal the wounded using this chalice. And then there are stories of Jesus and Mary coming into France. There are stories of, you know, deaths in France and children and all of that. I mean, who knows? It got to mm -hmm. a stage where for me, it's like, am I getting too much into this and getting distracted? And how is this relevant to my life and how I'm living my life? And what's it telling me about me? And how do I embody and live this? It was all totally what I needed to read in here because I needed to make peace with religion, not just Catholicism, with a lot of religion. I needed to make peace with it because I didn't want to be bullied by it and I didn't want to be less than and I wanted to take part and live it and pass it on. Because if I didn't, then I would be coming from fear rather than love. Mm. And that defeats the object of the exercise for me. Wow. You know, what's so interesting to me about that is that's why I got into it as well. I grew up, I, I, I would say that I grew up Southern Baptist. Not really. My parents never really forced me to go to church, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, but I, I feel like I had such a fear of religion and Christianity for such a long time because mm -hmm. it seemed to me that just me being who I am and just living life, anything I did, I was going to go to hell. So I had to sit back and educate myself to the best of my ability. And, you know, started with reading the Bible and just, okay, so what happened to these other books? What are these other books? What is the, the book of Enoch, you know, for instance? So I started diving into all these different forms of the Apocrypha, and I kind of came to the same conclusion as you. These are really interesting stories, <laughs> but it allowed me to reconcile the fear that I had within and to move on. And just like you said, what does this have to do with me today? Mm. Does it really matter how true these stories are? What's the message? And when you start looking at the other religions and the other cultures, you start finding that there is a overall overarching message and theme. And it's all about love. Yeah. It's all about the God within. It's all about taking the deep breath, as we were talking about before, and releasing ourselves from pain, strife, and turmoil. Yeah. Yeah. And where would you say anger, rage, jealousy, all these so-called negative and bad things come into it. Ooh, interesting. I would say that, <clears throat> I would say that it's two sides of a coin, right? Mm -hmm. Because how can we know what love is without hate? You know, how can we know what it's like to experience loss and grief? You know, if you are constantly happy, how do you know if you're happy? You know, if you've never been angry or fearful and there's, different extremes that I'm not saying that the loss of a loved one or got to be a loss of a child or something like that, you know, but those are extremes and we're all here to learn certain lessons. But what I'm saying is it does teach us to be grateful for what we have and it allows us to have something to compare it to. Mm -hmm. And most of us are able to make those comparisons by reading these stories, by having a, what I call an understanding of what the true meaning was behind it, what was the theme behind it. So that way we don't have to go through that same level of pain and hurt in order to reach what we will call a level of virtue. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that I have needed to know my rage mm. and I've needed to know my sadness and I've needed to know my jealousy and all the other negative things, because maybe they're not negative. Maybe they are pure energy, creative, destructive, whatever I put on them. 
But if I don't know myself then, then surely I've missed an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if I have this in front of me and I know this part of me, then maybe it's not being fed with denial and avoidance, secrets and lies. And I believe anything that I deny in myself, well, I'm probably feeding it more energy by pushing it away rather than including it and being able to turn the volume up and down on it, depending on what's true. And there is a time for rage. If I was, if my wife was attacked, if there was someone being bullied or harmed in the street, I would like to think, and, and I have without thinking, and um, the drop of the hat shouted or growled <laughs> so loudly that just the shock breaks the spell. Mm -hmm. And I believe. You know, we talk about toxic masculinity and toxic femininity. They can be used for the good. Because sometimes it's time to be in battle. More often than not, it's with myself. Because that's how I walk my path and that's how I grow. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's with other people. Because in the name of safety, in the name of goodness, in the, the name of good, voral, good morals um, and my values. Yeah. So, go on. Now, so it, what it brings to mind, and I was explaining this to someone a few years ago about peace and that uh, I will consider myself peaceful. And the backstory about myself that I, I said this to you before we got started, but not to the, or to the audience though that I was in the military, I used to fight in competitions. I just, I thought that I need to become this vision of what I thought of man. And uh, so I, I molded myself in such a way. Since then, I left all that behind me and I've chosen peace. Now, the thing is, a lot of people aren't peaceful. A lot of people are harmless. And the mm. difference between being peaceful and harmless is a peaceful person can do great harm and chooses not to. A harmless person went back into a corner, will still do nothing. And with that, there's an old saying that says, <clears throat> it's better to be a warrior on a farm but, and not a farmer in the war. Because a warrior on the farm can still till the land, but any tool you put into the this farmer former warrior's hand is a weapon. But if you give a, a farmer just a pitch, they wouldn't know how to handle that in battle. Wow. Cheeky question. <laughs> Would you like to share a turning point or an epiphany of your own? Oh, for sure. So there was, this is back when I was finishing up my degree in biochem. And I was on my way to graduate school. I was, I was finishing up the application. You know, you have to get recommendations from your professors. So I went to my favorite professors, uh, my biochem professor, my physics professor, and my calculus professor, because I just need three recommendations. Each one of them gave me some advice that steered me away from getting a PhD and turned my life around. And ultimately, what they said was my physics professor we were talking about particle physics one day and I was, re I was going over his research and in his dissertation that he wrote to become a, to get his PhD, he was talking about red, blue, and green particles. So I asked him if we were talking about the color frequency, the frequencies of the color themselves. And he said, yeah. so I was confused. Why are we talking about this? Thing? So then he says, the colors themselves are arbitrary. I just have to give them a name. Most things in the universe. We just have to name them in order for us to have an understanding, be able to talk about it. And I was, at the time I was taking a class called the philosophy of science as well. And we, we talk about that. We talk about the perception of reality itself. And we have to agree that we're sitting here on a call speaking English in order to move forward in the conversation itself. And we have, and we start, as we progress in the conversation, we have to take time to say, are you familiar with this concept? 
Are you familiar with it? We have to have an agreement of, of what someone else wrote <laughs> before we can move forward. So that was one of my first realizations about life. I had the same thing with my, it wasn't biochemist, it was my organic chem professor. And I didn't understand why you have certain molecules when they move in space, depending on the rotation of the molecule, it has a different effect, a different function. That didn't make sense to me. So why does why are you telling me that if it spins left, it does this? If it spins right, it does that. Who said left did this? Who said right did that? And he explained to me the same concept. Well, we had to identify. The point is, when they spin opposite of each other, then you have a different effect. It didn't matter if we said it was up, down, or left, or right. You know, we were talking about the Hans rule. The spins have to be indirectly related to each other. I was like, oh, that makes sense. So... When I coupled that with trying to go get a PhD and I had realized that I was no longer this fighter or warrior and feeling like I was constantly in the midst of battle and I was truly enjoying asking what I originally thought were scientific questions and then learned that they were philosophical questions. That's when I realized not only had I changed, but I did not have to be that previous person. But there's also nothing wrong with that previous person. And I literally called my dad. <laughs> and I said, hey, dad, I'm not going to graduate school. And then he laughed at me. And I thought he was going to say, why not? What he said was, I'm happy you figured that out before you got there. <laughs> wow. That is <laughs> the perfect response. Yeah. Yeah, and then my life changed, and now we're here. <laughs> wow, that is amazing. Huh. Yes, pretty, pretty great. Well, <laughs> oh, I feel like this conversation took a lot of twists and turns, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just all about it. That's what we're here for. <laughs> but Mr. Keenan, we only have a few minutes left. Is there anything you'd like to leave with the audience before we go? When we went, a few days before we went on lockdown um, in the UK, a friend of mine said, I've got the symptoms, you'd better isolate. So I went on Zoom and I kept listening for gunfire and I kept looking out of the window expecting to see the military. And I had some strange feelings in my body. And then two or three days later, I realized it's that I was triggered back to my childhood. And I realized also, and then we went on lockdown, and I realized a lot of people are going to be triggered. And they're going to either lash out on other people or lash in on themselves with whatever bad behavior. And from that day, we've had online groups every day. And... They are in the U UK time, but we also have evening groups and every day people who I've trained to hold the groups and to communicate and to ask questions, I'm either there or they are there or usually both. And people come in from all the world, all across the world. And it's absolutely, absolutely magnificent. So that's there for anyone who wants to hang out, be heard and get real. And I feel it's tragic how few people are actually heard. And I've really enjoyed the way I feel heard by you. And I've listened to you and look at where we've gone. So for people that want to come and take part in that, it's mensgroups.co.uk. For people who want more, I do private sessions. I train people to hold their own groups. I supervise people. And for me, it's all about whatever is in the way between myself and love. God, power, passion, purpose, whatever it is, that's what we move aside quickly, efficiently, and sustainably. And I'd like to think that I'm available at all levels. And we've got mixed gender groups every fortnight as well. But make contact. My, what's my email address? There's a chapter in a book written about me, and they called me the man whisperer. I'm 60 now. I need to let that go. <laughs> but my email address is kenny at the man uk. so ask and let's see how life might open up but happy to be here with you 
and happy to serve. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mrs. Kenny Day Cruz, for coming on. And thank you all for tuning into this episode of Play in Soup. I truly had a good time, and I hope you did as well. <laughs> so, everybody, have a great one. Blessings.